Okay. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. Lovely to see you here again. Thank you for coming, taking time out in this lovely evening. Um, this evening we're going to be talking in our series um, on, on sizes and shapes. This particular slide was created... Okay, I'll, I'll wait. <laughs> Sorry. Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Uh, I think you guys that have just come in, sorry, I think you're going to get not to be able to see me and the screen. So maybe come down to this side here or that side there. Maybe this side here. You have to see the me and the screen, you know. <laughs> okay, so welcome again. Thank you for coming. Um, this this uh, opening slide, uh, it, it comes from a presentation that was prepared by the Equus team uh, to, to one of the... Um, the markets, and this one was in Cannes last year, sometime, uh, and prepared by the team. So I'll tell you a little bit, about, bit more about the, the series and, and the wishes and hopes, and hopefully you might be interested in hearing more at the end tomorrow. Okay. So today we're talking sizes and shapes. And we know that within the equids now, there are an enormous number of sizes and shapes. But today we're focusing, and here we've got the zebras we talked about yesterday, asses, donkeys, and so on. But we're going to focus our attention today on the horse. And I, I'm sure I don't have to go through all the labels here. I probably for the non-biologist, uh, non just to note that this spot here is the croup, and this is the withers. And the height of a horse or a donkey or a, a pony is measured uh, to the withers. Now, very briefly, the difference between a, a pony and a horse, a pair, uh, other than the obvious size difference and the proportion difference, there are apparently temperament differences and personalities. For example, ponies are not so keen on jumping over walls. They're, uh, they're, much, more, uh, uh, they're much more discerning on what they'll be prepared to do, but they're apparently very kind and gentle. And it's only relevant really in one point in our talk tonight. Now, just to remind you, we left off yesterday with the Hyksos. The Hyksos were the tribe from, from the Middle East, from the ancient Middle East, who had infiltrated Egypt in about 1700 BC, about 4,000 years ago. Uh, and they brought their horses and their chariots and, and, and other kutuma with them and uh, took over Egypt for approximately 100 and 120 years. Uh, and what we're going to start off by, because that had a great influence on Egypt, but then on the rest of Africa as well. And so we're going to ask uh, uh, the question, well, what did these horses look like, uh, and, and where did they come from, and how did they get to be that way? And what we can see from many of much of the artwork, and we do have to remember that artwork, though probably is not necessary as accurate, obviously, as measuring, for example, the height of a bone. We do know that if you see repeated artwork of different times from different cultures, sort of z zoning in on the same thing, we can say, but that's reliable. And so what we can see from this particular piece of art, by the way, this I think is an onager down here, perhaps a mule, um, and that clearly shows that they were crossbreeds in Egypt. Um, but this shows that this, this horse looks quite small, and if you look in the next one, even smaller. So this was a, in the 18th dynasty of Tutmosis IV, about 1400 BC, and they repeatedly drew uh, beautiful artwork uh, where the humans were much taller than the, than the horses. The horses were perfectly proportioned, small ears, slightly dished faced, sorry you can't see there, uh, and beautifully formed arched necks with a high tail carriage, an important point that will come up later. Um, to say that this is therefore a horse, not a pony, I think that was the point that we had that earlier slide in. 
So to, as with anything, we have to go back in time to, find the, to, to understand the present. And just to remind you, and I don't know if there was anyone that wasn't here yesterday, maybe one or two people, we summarized in, in, in three points. Equus developed in North America, a complex uh, evolutionary pathway about four million years ago it started. Um, and the first real equid which entered Asia was a, a zebra-like, donkey-like creature, rigid spine, long neck and legs, and a donkey-like skull, and about 1.3 hands high. Um, just to, for, for those like myself that don't know what a hand is and whose hand it is anyway, uh, 1.3 hands, and one, uh, actually 13 hands, I sh it's a mistake there, it should be 1.3 meters. <laughs> Uh, so about 13 hands is about 1.3 meters. And we found that during the major glaciation in the Pliocene, uh, that's when they diversified and died off in the Americas. And we had a question last night, well, what happened to them? Well, we'll get to that tonight. So starting 10,000 years ago, where we sort of left off from, from well, we, 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 we went through 10,000, but I mentioned that there, there were really four types wandering around the Eurasian continent. Uh, the heavy draft type horse, the Przalski or Taki, the Tarpan, and an Afro-Turkic or Oriental. I will use these words interchangeably, Afro-Turkic and Oriental, even also Turkmen. They were all that type of taller horse, longer, slimmer, thinner skin, uh, more gracile. Now, I want to talk briefly about chromosomal differences because we want to ask, can all these horses, could they have interbred? And we would know that from extrapolating from modern information. So I'll tell you a bit about a chromosome, since I'm a cell biologist, I had to get one slide in. <laughs> um, as you know, every cell of the body has a nucleus in which the DNA, the DNA codes for the structure and the morphology and the physiology of any animal. Inside there, the DNA DNA is, is a double helix, as you know, but basically it has to be packed into a tiny space. And so it's coiled up and coiled up and coiled up and coiled up, and then divided into, into little packages. Um, an analogy I was thinking of is that if you, if you go to the supermarket and you buy a thousand rands worth of groceries, if you pack it into eight packets or ten packets, it's the still, still the same groceries. So the number of chromosomes doesn't really tell you how, many, how much DNA or how many genes there are. It's just the packaging of them. Um, and that becomes critical when we want to understand different species of equids and also when we want to crossbreed. And so in horses, they have 64 chromosomes, and as I say, they occur in pairs. And this is a male, this is what's called a karyotype. And you can see this is a male because there's one X chromosome and a small Y chromosome. Um, now, so let's just touch briefly on what is a species, what is a breed, and I want to mention briefly what hybrid vigor is. So a species is very easy to understand if you think of our favorite cats and dogs. Can you imagine how long it took me to select the right picture from the internet? I got completely distracted by all the lovely pictures. <laughs> but we know cats and dogs can't crossbreed. They are species. They've got different DNA and they've got different chromosomes. And so they will never crossbreed. Breeds, on the other hand, here are a whole lot of dogs. We know dogs, and this is a result of human intervention and uh, uh, selection, positive selection, can go from very small to very large, and they can breed. They can crossbreed, and they do, and they create all sorts of peculiarities. When you breed them pure, then you get a, a collie is a collie, a, a, a beagle is a beagle, but it's when you mix them that they're not. But they can mix because they've got the same number of chromosomes. They just might not physiologically mix, by the way. I mean, there might be some that couldn't survive for physiological reasons. Hybrid vigor, I just want to say, is when you're breeding a breed, um, and that's got to do a lot of to with for when we have conservation of species. If your pool or population of an animal gets too small and they breed with each other, what happens and that would happen with humans too. That is why most societies prevent cousin marriages, even distant marriages, is because 
the chance mutations, the, the deleterious effects on the DNA, if you keep breeding within a, a small group, that will eventually come out and uh, it will cause uh, that particular breed to taper down. So breeding is a, a complex science. Uh, and so every now and then when that sort of thing happens, when a breed is going down, then you take a chance and you bring in an outsider, which will bring in the correct undamaged gene, but it could change the morphology. Um, and that's what happened. Uh, you will see that one of the horses we, uh, we will talk about today is commonly used for hybrid vigor. Okay, so, why, so of these four horse types, Przalski, which is still living, as you know, um, in, a small, uh, in a small area in Russia and Mongolia, and the rest of the horses are all around the world, Przalski's got 66 chromosomes. So it is a different species. It is a different species, though it's a horse. The others have got 64. What will happen if you cross them? What will happen is you have, because don't forget, when you cross, you have half of that and half of that. So it's 33 and 32, you get 65 chromosomes. And if you have 65, there's somebody that hasn't got a partner. Uh, and that causes sterility. However, I did happen to read the other day that somebody has successfully crossbred a Przalski with another horse, I can't remember which. And furthermore, that hybrid was fertile, but only for one round. When it crossbred, that particular breeding kicked out that extra chromosome and it was sterile. So that's quite interesting. So we only really have two species of horse and that, if I remind you from, from earlier yesterday, here they are on the cladogram, just Przalski and the horse is of course Cabalus. There are many, 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 many breeds of horse across the world. Now, the different breeds as we've bred them uh, they've been bred to be adapted or we've taken those that are adept, adapted and bred them further. And so we have horses that are adapted to cold, to steppe, to mountainous terrain, to meadowland type terrain, um, to mountainous areas, desert mountains, sandy mountain, uh, yeah, savanna, rocky, rocky mountain. We have horses and we've selected them over thousands of years in breeding to get horses that are specialized for these different terrains. Now let's go, we've got, we were at 10,000 years, now we're at 4,000 years and this is when humans started to remember domesticate. And um, at this stage, by this stage, uh, there's a new species, a new, uh, in, in, in the fossil uh, record, a smaller horse called the Caspian, and there's strong evidence that the Caspian is derived from the Oriental, or Afro-Turkic. This Afro-Turkic and the Tarpan are really the precursors of almost all, and, and, and the draft, those three are the precursors of all the horses we have on the earth today. And here I've just given a size to show that the Afro-Turkic is by far the tallest, 1.5, apparently even 1.6 meters, very beautiful. And going down, down, down with the Caspian 1.2, some of them are only one, apparently, much smaller. So what analyses have shown, at, at the time we were, began domesticating, there are, f are those five types. Type 1 came from the Tarpan, and this is where we get the, the, the North European Exmoor pony and a whole lot of different ponies in Northwest Europe. Type 2 came from Brzalski, it's bigger and heavier, uh, and it has given rise to the Highland pony and the Norwe Norwegian Ford, amongst others. By the way, they've used Norwegian Ford to actually bring hybrid vigor back into uh, Brzalski. Then we have the tarpan contributing to types three and type four. Type, type three is producing the bigger Akalteki, Turkmenian, Oriental type, which uh, is commonly called warm-blooded. And then also from the tarpan, a much smaller type, probably the forerunner of the Caspian. And then lastly, we have the draft horse, giving rise to all the heavy horses and carriage horses we see largely in Northern Europe and they are commonly called cold-blooded. 
Uh, and just want to add a little bit, which makes an interesting story for us. In the Iberian Peninsula, in the Sp peninsula where there is Spain and Portugal, um, just south of the Pyrenees Mountains that divides Spain and France, uh, there were two groups during this early selection. In the north region, is a, there are horses called the Celtic, uh, and where we have the Indo-European Celtic peoples. Now, the Celtic peoples were being pushed by the nomads from the Mongolians, uh, pushing, 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 um, because the Mongolians had horses, and we will hear more about that tomorrow. Um, and they set, set, settled in there in the second millennium, millennium, and they gave rise to the Garano and all the North European American horses. So in the north of Iberia, that's what you get. And in the south, you get uh, the Saraya. The Saraya I mentioned yesterday, very similar to the, uh, to the, to the Tarpan, or the ancestor. Uh, it has stripes and a primitive look. I think I have a picture just to remind you of the... Uh, of the Soraya, Soraya, and we also showed you yesterday how amazing uh, this must have been the horse that was present 30,000 years ago when this artwork was created in Lascaux and many other caves in Europe. By the way, you know, there is controversy that these, um, these drawings could have actually been uh, painted by Neanderthals, because Neanderthals were present at 30,000 years ago in the same place. And just last week, a paper has come out in Science that confirms absolutely that humans and Neanderthals were crossbreeding in, uh, in this area for, 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 for a long time, as well as, by the way, another breed of hominid Denisovans up in Asia. So genetics has shown that amazingly. Okay. Let's just see. So I put the Sarai just to remind you there because he's going to come up in our story again in a, in a while. Now, let me talk briefly about the Caspian horses, that little small horse. It, they, they were thought to be extinct. They had found them in the, uh, the fossil record. But in uh, 1965, Louis Feroz, a, a, a French scientist, was exploring along the Caspian Sea, and they came upon these herds of, not large herds, of these very small horses, one to 1.2 meters high. Um, and there were other horses in the region. It's not that they were there alone. It's quite interesting that they haven't crossbred with the larger horses that were there. The Turkmen, Akalteki type, and even the Mongolian breeds were there. So they must have isolated niches in the environment. They have, must have been isolated by mountains, by sea, by, by, by lakes, by seas, uh, that they stayed pure breeding for such a long time. Of course, once they were discovered, they were then uh, put they were on an endangered list and they were, in a sense, rescued from, <coughs> from extinction. So, importantly, they are Arab type. In other words, I'll come to Arab, but that little rising tail and the dish nose does tell you that probably, possibly Arabians and Caspians came off the same line during either domestic, probably during some type of domestication. And um, there is a lot of artwork and artifacts representing this Caspian type. There's an error there right across Babylon, Syria, Anatolia, which is modern Turkey. Okay, so what can we conclude? We know that th this horse was prevalent in the Middle East. We know the Hyksos came from the Middle East. We've seen the drawings, and we therefore must conclude that or, uh, there's a strong evidence. And remember I talked about different types of evidence? We've got biogeographic evidence as well as physical evidence as well as artwork. That's all pointing us to saying this is pretty strong evidence that the Hyksos brought in small uh, Caspian horses. Look how incredibly small they are. Now, the Egyptians were, were, were quick on the mark, and they uh, realized that the Hyksos were bringing in something uh, pretty good, horses, chariots, other war weapons. And though they were defeated, they soon gathered their forces and took on and learnt about horses and about chariots and about different types of warfare. Um, and then they started breeding and they started bringing in horses, more horses from, from the Middle East. This particular depiction, the grooms are waiting outside their temple 
of the tomb of uh, Haramhib, it's clear from the interaction that this is not a metaphorical. In other words, this is not just something in the writings, but they were, there was clearly a very close physical relationship developing, something which I mentioned yesterday. Interestingly, there was lots of communication, of course, going on in the Middle East, and um, the, this uh, particular depiction shows there were other horses which, we, which they called tall Assyrian horses. At some stage, the Egyptians wrote to the Syrians and said, please send us some tall horses. And the important thing that was happening at the time is that, uh, that uh, warfare was moving from men with feet on the ground, boots on the ground, to men riding horses. And if you're going to ride a horse, it's better to have a bigger horse. And so the bigger horses started to come in as well. Um, here you see a one, this is actually a piece of a very big panel uh, depiction uh, in 18th dynasty tombs and uh, though you can't see it here, um, you can see what they had in each line were the horses and they depicted the people that brought those horses or had that type of horse. So you can see Syrians from their clothing, you can see African Nubians, you can see um, uh, Mesopotamians and so on. Beautiful, beautiful panels that are very rich in information. And this is wonderful. Of course, horses, once they were there, they were not ridden by the masses, even by the armies yet. They were ridden by kings. And they were greatly revered and greatly valued. And so they were used as diplomatic gifts. So if you don't want your enemy to come and uh, come into your land, give them a few horses. And the extraordinary um, uh, cuneiform tablets were found at Amana. Uh, I don't know the date of the discovery, uh, where the king was offering uh, a Mitanni, uh, which were to accompany a Mitanni bride. So the Mitannians are up near Assyria, actually up near the Caspian. And um, she was the daughter of a Mitanni king, Tazrata, who, um, and they sent a groom, well, they were offering a groom as well. Um, and I think this is a quote. Is it from? Yes, from, from this. Fr from, from this. Okay, a beautiful horse that runs swiftly, a chariot. It's covered all of gold, a whip overlaid with gold, necklaces for the horse a set of bridles of ivory and reins overlaid with silver. Tomorrow you'll see a lot more of this sort of, informa of this sort of quality of the materials and stuff that has been buried and which has been recovered. And also, interestingly, also from the Mitanni, the Mitanni uh, Kukuli was a Mitannian who wrote a manual um, of how to look after horses. Which, which was discovered in full, um, and which set me off deciding I needed to learn to read cuneiform. The problem is when you, you can read cuneiform, but you don't know what language it is in. I think cuneiform was being used right across the Middle East for all different languages. So anyway, it would be a wonderful thing to be able to read that. But what you can see uh, is that this depicts uh, how greatly they were varied here. It's being brushed and looked after. Okay, so now we're in Egypt. We have some idea that into Egypt were coming the Caspians, larger horses, and now we want to spread westwards, sitting in this area here. And I'm going to talk to the rest of the today about the spread westwards down into West Africa, in Nigeria, Chad, Cameroon, uh, and then I'm going to end off today in South Africa. So at the time, a few thousand years ago, the, the, um, the north of Africa was much greener and much richer than it is now. And it's written by the Greeks, by Herodotus, by many others. Uh, they were well watered and many plants and grains and fruits and grapes and pomegranates were grown. And obviously the right type of food fodder for horses. And so there's no doubt they moved along, uh, probably hugging the coast, but there were inland routes as well. 
This is just, by the way, how we see it now. You can see how barren uh, North Africa is. It starts to get green here. Carthage was there, and Cyrene was here. And this area was very fertile and rich. That is why the Carthaginians were dominating this area and why the Romans and the Greeks didn't like it very much and eventually conquered them so they could dominate the sea and all the trade here. And don't forget that the Carthaginians came from uh, uh, um, what is Israel, slightly north of Israel. So there was a lot of shipping going on um, uh, and, and therefore lots of exchange of horses because horses were being transported. Making, uh, un making it complex to understand what all these, the horses in Africa are actually uh, made up of. Um, so across Africa, the horses began to adapt to various different uh, terrains, harsh terrains, to become survivors. Um, we have lots of evidence, quite a lot of evidence of this. For example, in the Garamantes, this is pro approximately this region of the Sahara. This was an amazing culture that developed uh, and had, actually, they would ha they'd help Cape Town right now. They developed an amazing system of underwater uh, collection and tanks. And so they lived in the desert for a good uh, thousand or so years, not, uh, not having their water dry up. But eventually their water did dry up. Uh, they don't really know why. And the Matanians, the Garamantes, uh, left. But what we can see in, uh, in the artwork, this is, this is more recent, but here you can see, at this stage at least, they were riding a horse. Here is a beautiful horse with a man riding. Perhaps that is a weapon of sorts. And here you can see clearly a chariot uh, carrying a man and possibly being led by another one. This is about 1,000 BC. Okay, so now we get to the question of the, South, the, 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 the African barb. The African barb has got many names. Uh, uh, there are many sub-breeds uh, sub uh, living in different parts of North Africa. And what I'll be talking about is trying to answer the question, what contributed to the barb? What, what bloodlines? And then we'll go to, and what bloodlines has it influenced? And just this, this diagram depicts the players that I'm going to be talking about. We will talk about Arabians, the Orientals, the Tarpans, the Caspians. There's another Oriental here, and the Soraya. And we'll leave this guy out the picture for now. Okay, so the, the North African Barb is a, a very beautiful horse, very well adapted, uh, very hardy, very sturdy, uh, able to thrive in desert and dry and mountainous environments. Here, depicted most beautifully ceremonially, which uh, is still done in parts of North Africa, and I think we will mention some of it tomorrow. What are the features of it? It's long-legged, it's got a Roman nose, so the nose is rounded outside, uh, or a ram profile. It's got a flat shoulder, very erect neck, a low set tail, so that's critical. So you see that's where, that differs already from the Caspian. Remember that Caspian's tail was going up. Uh, low set tail, sloping hindquarters here. It's about 15 hands or 1.5 meters uh, at the withers here. And tough, docile, and very hardy. And just to put these two slides together so that you can see the difference between an Arabian and a Barb. Uh, just a, a few words about the Arabian, uh, and I'll, I'll show you a few more slides, did not arise in Arabia, actually, despite uh, everyone wishing that they were. And they're not the most ancient breed. Uh, and I, I guess one could question whether they're most beautiful, but most people think they're the most beautiful. Um, but they definitely didn't result from natural selection. They resulted from human intervention and human selection. But it is one of the oldest purebreds. That's the key thing. And in fact, but in Egypt, the real stud book only started, began in 1900. I don't know, and maybe people in the audience might know, whether there were stud books earlier uh, in some of the Middle Eastern countries. Now, the barb 
uh, as I've said, was just wanted to show you this lovely piece of artwork with fiery temperament, great stamina. So there are two theories of the origin. It's clear that there's some relationship with the horses of Spain, the Saraya. So one theory is that they, they came across from Egypt, right across, bringing in maybe oriental uh, blood, mainly oriental blood, and then mixing as a result of all the trafficking going on in the Mediterranean early and later. The other alternative theory is that they actually are originally, or they have a great deal, and, and that the Sarayas or their precursors crossed over somehow um, as a result of ancient exchanges, except it's a much, much older breed. So these really are Romans, the Carthaginians, are in modern, really modern historical times. Um, we also know that um, as the Moors swept across Africa and then up into Spain, we know that they also came uh, with Arabians largely, and that would have increased the, the Arabian portion. So what we're beginning to see is that the Bab is made up of a whole lot of different breeds. So it's definitely has Soraya in, it has Caspian in, it has Arabian in, and it has Oriental in. And I think I've got a slide, sorry, just to remind you of the Caspian. Um, and I just wanted to show you a few really nice, beautiful slides um, that the, the, uh, the Arabian came in, um, and, and that's, that's the question. So I'm not going to be giving you answers here, just telling you that the literature is rough with confusion. Um, but what we can be certain is the Arab did come in. It was part of a lot of mythology as well the Arabians, and therefore the Babs as well. Uh, this particular um, Emir Abdel Ed Qadr uh, of the 19th century, recently, wrote a very evocative description. This is him here, and this is uh, one of the uh, paintings that became prevalent at the time. Beautiful paintings of Arabians and their, their carers. And he wrote of how Allah created the Arab out of the sound of wind. I have called thee the horse. I have created the Arab. I have bestowed upon thee the color kumat. I have attached good fortune to the hair that falls between thy eyes. Thou shalt be the lord of all other animals. Men shall follow thee wherever thou go. Good for pursuit as flight. Thou shalt fly without wings. Upon thy back shall riches repose. And through thy means shall wealth come. Then he signed them with a sign of glory and good fortune, a star in the middle of the forehead. There. So it's a lovely piece of writing. But the Arab is part of mythology across, uh, really, the whole of Europe. Um, the distinctive confirmation of the Arab really captured the interest of the Orientalist poetings. The Orientalists were fascinated, in general, with things other. Um, and the romantic allure, for example, of North Africa, the people that lived there, and the, inquest, uh, the, the horse inhabitants. And so you see this beautiful Orientalist painting, but what it's useful to know is that it is showing horses of much greater size than those earlier Caspians that we saw. Um, and these were, uh, these were Arabs, and you can see that the dish face there and the dish face there, uh, and these are barbs. You can see the much straighter ram nose uh, there and there. And you can see the tail, the low-hanging tail, whereas uh, in the Arab tail uh, flying high, flying high there and mounted very high here. Um, and I just put into the Sarah to remind you again that this mixed was coming into the barb. So 
the modern molecular geneticists have come into the frame and said, well, can we solve the problem? Since we know how to take DNA from everything now, and we can sequence it, uh, and we can study human evolution from it, can we solve the problem of where the barb came from? Is it Spanish, Iberian origin, or is it African uh, orientalist, um, ori uh, Turkmen, Akalteki type? And so just a, a brief note on, on how you actually do this. It's really amazing, and it's really only been perfected of getting bones. Getting, bones from, uh, getting DNA from bones is quite easy. Getting DNA from fossil bones has been amazing. And the pushback of getting DNA from older and older and older fossils now, a good, good uh, you know, back into the, the Pleistocene. It's absolutely amazing. But where, wh why, why can we get DNA out of bone is because here's a, a femur. If you look at bone inside, it's made up. It looks like a sponge. And in the sponge, each one of these things, it's circular like that. And the cells of bone are, are lodged in these hard and calcified, which eventually uh, calcified and in fossils become fossilized. And they trap some cells and they trap some of the DNA fortuitously for us. And so we can then take this, we drill this out, and you, and, you, and you grind it up in a grinder. And here you get some of the, the ground bone. And then we, we extract DNA from it. If you're dealing with fossil species, in fact, any species, what you have to make sure when you're doing this is you have to be in a room where nothing else is there. No other, so if, you, if you're extracting from a Pleistocene horse, then you must never be in a room that ever had another horse because actually it's amazing how contamination can occur. And then what we do is we put it through an amazing technology that basically reads the pieces of DNA in little bits like this. And then computer-wise, bioinformatically, those can then line up and then you can read a piece of DNA or a piece of a chromosome from one end to the other. And by doing that, you can compare species A with species B. And what did that tell us? What we knew anyway. That this very complex science with many, many papers, well, it turns out the, the, the barb is made up of a mixture of Arabian, Sarai, actually Andalusian as well. But Andalusian also has barb in it. So there's a lot of back and forth been going on for a lot of long time. Okay, so now let's look at the influence of the barb on other horse types. Sorry. So, in Europe, the barb became very popular and began to be an exquisite looking creature and it began to be exported across the, uh, the courts of Europe. So it started to spread all the way through Europe to the various courts. And in fact, it significantly contributed to the venture, the thoroughbred that we have now. So a great deal of thoroughbred blood is in fact barb. Um, but Henry, Henry VIII was particularly fond of them. And here again, look at the beautiful straight nose or even uh, uh, ram nose, uh, long legs, tail hanging down. Uh, they are revered in many places, in many museums in the world, in the Palazzo de Te, uh, built for Federico de Gonzaga, uh, who was the Marquis of Mantua. This is about 1524, had a stable, and this hall is full of magnificent paintings of horses and statues. Um, and Emperor Charles V was so impressed with this particular display that he, he made the Marquess into a duke. He thought that was the best thing to do. Now, what, what began to happen, now Barbary, the race of the Barbary horse, the Barbary horses are all the barbs, uh, referred to the barb horses along the north coast of Africa. Now they were prevalent in Europe. Um, and in the Roman, annual Roman carnival, it began uh, in, in a road called the Via del Corso, running uh, through, through the center. Um, of Rome, that there was an annual horse race. And uh, what made the race so exciting and dangerous was a bit like the chasing of the bulls in Spain. They actually ran through built-up uh, 
narrow streets. Uh, and the streets were filled with spectators and there were buildings on the side and they were crammed in and they were overlooking uh, in, onto the streets. And this is what the Via uh, del Corso looks like right now. There you see the buildings, you can just imagine horses running down and, uh, and, 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 and rushing through that small space there. And in fact, what, um, I'll come back to that. So again, the artists got, uh, got to be fascinated by this, and we have a whole lot of artwork by Verne, Pinelli, Garakou, and also um, Degas here. And these two pictures start, uh, depict the start of the race, where the handler or the rider is trying to calm the horse down. Uh, again, you can clearly see the barb nature beautifully done up, ready to run. And here they are holding them back. There's the line across trying to hold them back. Incidentally, the race was ended, sadly, when a child apparently ran across uh, one, one, one era and was trampled. And so the king of the time uh, stopped the races. Here you can see still other paintings of them holding back. They seem very keen on that. And then they're off and they run down the road. Here's uh, Erica's depiction of that happening, lovely picture. And of course, like a, ski, a skier going down a ski slope, you've got to stop them at the end. And so they had a curtain up here and a lot of people around them trying to stop them as the horses were racing down. Uh, and this is beautifully depicted in this lovely, lovely horse here. Now, we get to the Americas. So, we know that the barb horse and the Soraya and the Andalusian, there were lots of horses being bred in, in Spain. They were the leaders of, uh, of horse breeding. And we know the Spanish and the Portuguese were explorers. And of course, they, were t they took their horses. How did they take their horses? There are, there are pictures of it, how they slung them. Uh, in, in, in slings to keep the feet off the ground um, so that they didn't fall over and break their legs. But of course, many of those horses would not have survived those very, very long journeys. Um, so the conquistadors moved across both into North and into South America, creating the many, many breeds that we have in the Americas now, and that's how the horses came back to America. And then we now turn to Africa. All of them had died, so there was nothing at the time. So in fact, it must have been fascinating for the peoples living there the, that uh, suddenly, in fact it was. We know what happened with the conquistadors. We know in, in, in Central America, they were pretty well slaughtered by a few men on a few horses and hundreds and hundreds of people uh, in, in, in Central America. Um, Yes, 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 yes. So they, 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 yes, that's right. So we picture the Indian culture to be horsey, but actually they only got their horses much later. Um, and again, uh, so they were bringing horses through here into the islands here. They were getting into the Americas. I don't know if they traversed up through the, uh, the, the Central America region here. But yes, they are newcomers to America. Okay, so um, n now we're going to look at a little bit of the barb spread in Africa. Firstly, in, in West Africa. I think it's not well known, certainly to South Africans, that West Africa has a very vibrant and vivid horse culture. Just a few pictures to show you this lovely, beautiful picture of a, 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 a probably a Nigerian or a Cameroonian a uh, soldier mounted on a horse f in full armor, um, possibly a barb. You can see quite a straight uh, nose here. And why were they doing this? Because in West Africa was made up of many, many, many kingdoms. And the kingdoms were fighting each other, as all kingdoms do, for a long period of time. And they were using their horses in that. Here you see them depicted in this beautiful artwork uh, called D Dogon. The Dogon figures are, are of the horses and riders depict the prestige and power, so obviously greatly revered. And you can see that in, in all cases, the horses have the straight nose. 
They clearly barb horses. Um, you will notice a distinctive profile, low slung tail. And these figures come from about AD 900 to 1500, 1500. Now, in, um, in, in Cameroon and in northern uh, Nigeria, this is in the region where all that trouble is where those young girls were abducted in that uh, region of Nigeria. Uh, you have this particular horse. It's called a Dongolo horse. And it's a bar mix and possibly mixed with a Numidian. Now, the Numidia is south of Egypt. And so if you can picture that Cameroon is like in the middle of Africa, and it's getting influence from Numidia, and it's getting influence from the bar from West Africa. So it's a quite a small horse. Very, people are very critical of it. It's uh, a bit strangely uh, organized. <laughs> it's got, thin, well, they say, it's got thin legs, a proportionally a uh, big head and a big body, and a flat croup. Um, these horses have been crossbred with pure Arabs or, and barbs, who are, you could never say barbs are purebred, but uh, in order to improve it, so hybrid vigor. Now, in, 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 in also in Cameroon, Central Africa, there's another breed called the Musi Pony, a lovely pony, possibly also a hybrid of the Caspian and the Bob, quite a lot smaller. Um, I, I, I read this word pony and then I ask, but this is probably a horse, not a pony. But you know the word pony is used broadly, uh, just to show you where Cameroon is. So it can be influenced by the Egyptian Nubians coming down like that and from the Bob's coming this way. In fact, there were migrations across the desert. There's evidence to show all these migration pathways right across the, the Sahara Desert. Now, you will have noticed that there are no horses across the equator. I've only focused my attention on North Africa. I put a horse here and I said, we'll come back to him now. Why? Well, it turns out the Tsetse fly barrier, the horse sickness. So right across here, this map shows the, uh, the, 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 the prevalence of it. Um, they're parasites, as you know. They bite, the horse flies bite, and they transmit a, um, a, 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 a trypanosome. A trypanosome is a protozoan organism that then infects uh, the blood cells and the, the horses die of horrendous disease. Um, and humans, of course, die from sleeping sickness from the same infection. Interesting enough, before we move on, the Musi pony is resistant to Tsetse fly. So obviously, that's, uh, that, that right in that central region, it would have evolved being resistant to the Tsetse fly. And now we move to the south. So horses did not naturally move to the south. They couldn't get through, they died. Um, humans, don't forget, had been moving to the south eons ago. The Bantu tribes had moved into Cameroon and then had moved south into Zimbabwe, into South Africa. So there were peoples in the southern part of Africa, but there were no horses. Remember, there were zebras, and it's hard to find, but I think it's, I found no evidence that there were donkeys either. Donkeys, I think, are also susceptible to tsetse fly, but maybe somebody will tell me in a while. <laughs> Okay, so let's talk about South Africa. We are perfectly on time here. So we know the story of, so the African tribes were uh, living in, in, in Southern Africa. We had the Griquas, we had the, what they called at the time the Hottentots, the Khoi, um, and the Dutch East India Company, or well, prior to that, the Portuguese, we'll talk about that tomorrow, but the Dutch East India Company uh, began to send ships by the Cape to set up a way station, a fueli fueling station, and met with the, the, the local uh, Khoi, Khoi San, and began to negotiate around uh, space, about use of forage, and so on. And we will expand tomorrow on that political relationship. But at the, in the beginning, it was largely friendly. So the ships came by, and there were no horses. Van Riebeck had no horses. 
He didn't have any. So he arrived at the Cape with no horses. And, he, and I think that's the next slide. Let, it seems to have got out of sequence. So I'm going to have to, you'll have to apologize here. So the VOC, he kept writing to the VOC, and I have some quotes. Um, let's, let me just find them quickly. Yeah. Okay. So Van Riebeck was battling to survive, and he needed horses. Obviously, horses change the way civilization can develop. Uh, he needed them to fetch wood, to plow the fields, to thresh wheat. And he wrote in 1654. Remember, he arrived in 1652. If I only had horses, he said, after his stallion, he'd already had one then, was eaten by the lions. <laughs> And then he said, it to be wished that we had a few more horses. So he kept writing these missives to the Dutch East India Company. Uh, and he had two. But he said, oh, please, I want more. I want. The ones that we have are only being used for brick making. They were building the castle here in Cape Town, 1654. And then he dispatched letters. In, you can see in his letters, and, and, and Erika went down to the, the museum, uh, the, the parliament library, and uh, they've been fantastic in allowing, allowing Erika to see the diaries of uh, Jan van Riebeck translated. Uh, and uh, you can see in the tone and the voice the, the, the urgency and the begging, please send me horses, please send me horses. And the Dutch East Indian Company were not really keen on listening because they didn't want to develop a a, 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 a city or a town. They just wanted a way station. And they said no. Um, but eventually, eventually, sorry, I'm going to have to go back. So eventually, uh, and I'll show you the map from where these horses came from, eventually they decided to send him horses. And now they decided to send them from Java not from Europe. Why? Because the difficulty was, well, firstly, that's a much longer journey for horses to survive. And they were sailing on the trade winds. And they frequently, most commonly, they, they actually reach South America and then cross to South Africa. They don't hug the coast. And so the journey was long and arduous. And in fact, many of them, and when they'd get around here, they would miss South Africa and land up in Java anyway. So they knew that sending uh, the horses this way. And so they decided in the end to send some from Java itself. And so the first horses that arrived in South Africa were Javanese horses. And the Javanese horses have Mongolian uh, blood in them. And probably a bit of Afro-Turkic as well. Um, so so they often blew right past and landed up at St. Helena, where, where, where the horses landed. So there were, there were horses on St. Helena. Um, some survived, the, the shipwrecks and so on. And they lived there. And then at a later stage, uh, they took them, and some managed to get back to the Cape. But they proved difficult to catch again. <laughs> OK, so we've done that. Um, now. The colonists saw at the time they were struggling with getting horses. So they said, well, actually, why don't we just tame these wild horses that we're seeing, these stripy ones? And particularly, so they, they, they were, the mountain zebra was clear and the, and the plain zebra. And they were in vast numbers. And indeed, in here in the Cape, there was the quacha. And it said that uh, uh, Van Riebeck said in 1658, these quachas are so extraordinarily colored or marked, uh, are so extraordinarily colored or marked as you see nowhere else in the world. And as rarities, they would be above price. Not so. We unfortunately destroyed them. Uh, the VOC ignored his pleas, uh, and so he tried to tame some of these quachas. And there, there are wonderful stories of people going out and getting thrown off them and getting bitten and all sorts of things like that, to no avail. So into the melting pot, and I'm going to show you the slide. I've told you that in 1652 and later they came from Java. Then they began sending them from all over the world, from South America in 1778, from Persia in 1689, and then later from Spain, and then later more from Java. And I think um, that slide. So the numbers grew, 
Um, so by 1662, there was enough. And then they were free burghers. They were people that were no longer working for the Dutch East India Company. And they were farmers. And so they, they had their first sale of horses. And private citizens were able to buy horses. Um, coming from Persia, coming from uh, a bit more from Europe, and then from South America, and then some more from Spanish. So into this melting pot came all these horses and s sold to the burghers and, of course, uh, began to have the uh, a sort of uh, standing, not an army, but a security force. And uh, here we have a lovely depiction. Uh, the, dra the drawing is dated 1700. The artist is unknown, uh, possibly of a Dutch school, of some Boer, uh, a series called the Koi Drawings, where the, the, the locals are going out on a lion hunt. Beautiful drawings. So gradually, the breed, the mix that was coming in became differentiated. And uh, at a later stage, thoroughbreds were brought in. So at this stage, the British were in control and they were bringing in different horses. And it was from this founding stock, this mixture, um, the southeastern East Asia pony stock mixed with American and European that the Cape horse evolved. And this became famous for its hardy, hardiness, its sure-footedness, powers of endurance. And its descendants are, were the horses that were ridden by the Boer commandos in the Anglo-Boer War. And more of that we talk about tomorrow. And the question of whether it was this amazingly adapted horse that enabled the Boers to be so successful for so long. Here's a picture of uh, the bloodline. This is what it looks like. It's preserved today by the historic Budapest Breeders Society and the Cape Budapest Breeders Society. And here is a picture uh, of the Karl Haneke Budapest stud uh, of a whole lot of the members of that stud here. Uh, do you know where it is? <coughs> Not, Not sure. Okay. Okay, so I'm going to, we, we're picking up tomorrow on, um, we're going to tell you more about the historical and consequences of uh, power that the horses brought to cultures. We're going to be talking a little bit about the power that the Egyptians, a little bit about West African, and then quite a lot about South Africa and the various tribes and how the question of whether, when, uh, because if you start to see uh, in the wars, the African wars, the, the, the border wars with the Greek wars, you start to see that they were riding horses as well. So where did they get their horses and when and how? We will uncover that tomorrow. So with that, um, now why is it doing that? I leave you with some lovely pictures and happy to take com uh, questions. Now the bullpen, the yes. Bullpen. Yes. Do you know, Erika? We've got the book. We've got. We can, we can look it up. <laughs> Which is? Wait, let me um, give me the book, though. Um, the, did you st give the question about the Camargue? Did, did, did we answer? Let me. Let me. So the question, and then we'll look up Burapet as well. This is a wonderful book. It's Bonnie Hendricks. Uh, and it's got, it's not every, it's not every horse in the world, but ne nearly everyone. Um, and so we looked up the Camargue, which as you said, um, is in, 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 in southern France. Uh, P, Q, R. Caspian. Ah. What was it, was it called Camargue? C, A, M. A R C. So, oh, there we go. Camargue 95. And I think I think the the, the the question is: there's quite a lot written about them, and uh, maybe some of you have been there. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> and ridden these horses. They they they're used for tourism. Uh, you can go there. But I think the interesting question you asked was: where do they come from, and what type of horse they are? Um, Um, okay, 
So it describes their environment. The conquest of the Northern Command began at the end of the 19th century when vineyards disappeared, followed by grains and crops. The great herds of cattle and horses for which the region is famous are still found, especially around Vakar, in what became the Camargue Regional Park in 1928. A unique area, swamps and salt marsh, with flamingos that speak of Africa. The climate is harsh, scorchingly hot or icy cold. It's called, the Camargue horse is called the horse of the sea and has existed in this region since prehistoric times. Thought to be a descendant of the ancient and now extinct Solutre, S-O-L-U-T-R-E, which I'll have to look up for you. <laughs> um, bones of which found in southeast uh, France and the Camargue has been influenced by other breeds. Through centuries, armies have passed by the Camargue, including the Greeks, the Romans, who took them to Spain, and the Arabs. The breed was greatly admired by Julius Caesar. Possibly this horse had some influence on the early breeds in Spain. The Camargue horse is born black and brown and turns gray with maturity. Okay. And now you want to ask, what, you ask the size of the Buddha pet. Let's see if we can give you that answer. And while I'm looking up, are there any other questions? No. They all died out. That's, well, actually the, uh, yes, exactly. Uh, um, I don't think Columbus didn't take horses, so he never introduced. It was the conquistadors. Yeah. And they ran away, yeah. Let's see, Budapest 106. Ah, I'm going to give you the answer. Budapest 106, Cape Horse, about 14 to 15 hands high. It's smaller. It's smaller, yeah. Budapest, Cape Horse, Kaps of Budapest. Light, riding horse, light draft. Rare. Sorry, another question? Yes. There must have been a massive influx uh, and breeding. Maybe, um, so when the Spanish came and they brought their horses, obviously some would have got loose and some would have been released. And it must have been that the environment was so suitable that they were able to breed so quickly. Uh, and then they would have had agreements and engagements with the, with the, the Indian populations, uh, trading agreements. And, gradually, and you're right, they spread so quickly. And they spread um, right across and they spread into all the different terrains, which does go back to the point of how extremely uh, um, adapted, that's the word, they are. They, you know, the different types of environments that they can live in and adapt so quickly. And, and what we know now, of course, is America has its feral horse problem as they've started to release them now.